You're listening to Across the Table, a healthcare private equity podcast brought to you by McGuire Woods. Across the Table brings you inside the conversation with the specialists and professionals of the healthcare private equity industry. Hello and welcome to Across the Table, McGuire Woods Healthcare Private Equity Podcast. I'm Amber Walsh, Chair of the McGuire Woods Healthcare Department. My co-host is Holly Buckley, Chair of the McGuire Woods Healthcare and Life Sciences Industry Team. We are so pleased to be joined today by our partner at McGuire Woods, Scott Becker, who also is the publisher and founder of Becker's Healthcare and also has his own private equity podcast. Holly and I are really looking forward to talking to Scott today about some of the key themes that he has seen emerge throughout the various hats that he wears in the healthcare industry. Scott has a really unique opportunity to speak to a wide range of participants in the healthcare system in really a way that many of us don't. And Scott, we are constantly enthralled with what you know and how you put together all of the different components of the healthcare industry in a really digestible format, including for private equity investors. So we're really, really glad to have Scott join us today. We've actually kind of distilled this down, or Scott has distilled this down, into six key things that he has seen kind of emerge in his participation in the healthcare industry. So, Scott, I'm going to actually start with the first of these themes. But first, before I do, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Amber. And the best part of my private equity podcast, I get to talk to Amber Walsh and Holly Buckley regularly. So a great pleasure. But no, thank you for letting me speak with you guys today. Thank you. We have a lot of fun doing that, too. Well, let's start with the first thing, then. I'm going to use your words. You have described what you've seen as a gold rush to healthcare investing. I think you've seen it more in digital than in services recently, but a lot, a lot of activity, a lot of capital being deployed, and we'd love to have you just put a little finer point on this, describe what you have seen emerge. Certainly, and just a little bit of perspective for the audience. We're going to try and talk really about three or so issues around healthcare investing today, healthcare private equity investing, venture capital investing, and then three or so issues around health system strategy, what health systems are seeing, and sort of touch on those six points, three and three. In terms of investing in healthcare, you've seen this incredible success the last several years, really particularly rebounding through the pandemic of venture-based investments, private equity investments. And this came sort of unexpectedly, at least unexpectedly for most of us, not so unexpectedly for very successful venture capital and private equity funds. For the last several years, there had been a movement towards a large movement towards a lot of practice-type investment and provider service types of investment, and just a lot of funds, private equity funds, and investors involved in what we call provider-driven transactions, group practices, orthopedic specialties, ophthalmology, dermatology, plastics, dental, all kinds of provider-driven groups. What was lurking a little bit behind the surface and not as publicized, but has led to much bigger dollars was the explosion of healthcare technology in digital investments, many of which sort of moved along, companies were doing okay with them, whether telehealth, digital, predictive analytics, all kinds of things that people were doing fine with, venture capital investors were doing fine with, and something very well with, but that exploded over the pandemic. And now, of course, it seems so obvious, but there's been this tremendous amount of deal volume and dollars their transaction in the healthcare technology sector means so much money that it feels like a gold rush. I mean, an exclamation point on it was the Livongo transaction that Seven Wire Ventures, as well as Bill Frist firms, had a big involvement in, but a $16, $17 billion transaction. More recently, Microsoft buying Nuance, a communications firm, for $19 billion. It's been announced that amount. And there's sort of this gold rush to, oh, my goodness, there is so much going on. And obviously, all the people that were investing in digital and healthcare today, for those on the sidelines, it could seem so easy. And they've made so much money. And that's what sort of drives that gold rush mentality of people chasing it. And, of course, that ignores 
all the toil and all the risk that all those firms took. So you see this gold rush towards particularly healthcare, digital investments, technology investments, some still towards practice-driven transactions. That's been going on for a long time. And those were scathed during the pandemic, whereas the digital was not. And I guess the great question for everybody is health systems and healthcare ecosystem picks up and gets much more excited and much more vested in using all these kinds of new technologies is, are we in the first inning, the second inning, the third inning, or the eighth inning? That's really everybody's guess. And a lot of professional prognosticators believe that we're still, there's a lot of healthcare technology and digital investment to be done and to be exited in a few years. Obviously, people watch the interest rates as part of this. They're at historically low rates, and that's very supportive, of course, of valuations. But is there still a lot of money to be made Or are those of us that, you know, look to get into this later and get all excited about it, have we already missed the boat? Typically, there's this old game with somebody in a card game. If you don't know who the sucker is, that's you. And for many of us that don't know whether we're time to invest or not, then we might very well be late. But it's a fast thing to watch as the private equity and venture capital community really invest heavily in all kinds of digital technology offerings and all kinds of healthcare technology offerings and so forth. And so just... Just watching this has been fascinating from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, who have you been most excited to watch in this space? Is it the tech companies that are moving into healthcare, like Microsoft and Apple and others? Is it the healthcare companies that are moving into tech? Or which areas or companies do you think have made the most interesting and innovative moves? It's a great question. The thing that I found have found the most interesting, and it, I'll give a different perspective on it. The thing I found the most interesting is funds, venture funds that have been investing in this so heavily, many of which one hardly knew until they did so successfully well through this healthcare technology boom. Then those would be a handful of them. There are people like Seven Wire Ventures, which I was not really very familiar with, but they've got a star-studded roster, people that had invested early in all strips, people that were behind Livongo, one of the telehealth great successes. There's obviously Bill Frist stays in the game, of course. There's smaller firms like Live Oak Ventures that are founded by two immigrants and have just for 10, 15 years in Austin been cultivating and investing in digital technology companies, healthcare, a big part of that. There's people like, of course, Andreessen Horowitz, which we enjoy a relationship with, but not a significant one, but they've been so aggressively investing in these brilliant Silicon Valley technology companies that are focused on healthcare, yes, he has Sequoia Capital and others. So I've been really, really interested to me to watch that. The Amazon, the Microsofts are playing a different game. The Amazons of the world are $300 billion a year companies. They're in the, you know, the top of the Amazons, the second largest company in the United States by revenues after Walmart, the Apples of the world. Those are such behemoth companies that they could do so many things. They do some of them well, so many of them well. They do other things not as well. I don't find it as interesting to me to watch them. What I find interesting is these venture funds, these private equity funds, some of which have a few billion dollars under management, some of which have a billion dollars under management, some of less, but have made a hugely outsized impact in the healthcare technology space. I find it far more interesting to watch those than the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples, and so forth. So they're always going to be big players. They've got so much resources. Got it. No, that's fascinating. So maybe moving on to our second trend of the day, which is the investment in value-based businesses and value-based models. And we've certainly seen on the transactional side huge interest in these businesses, not just by funds, but also by payors. So curious to get your thoughts on how these businesses have been performing, how the pandemic has maybe changed things for them, and overall, what trends are you seeing? Absolutely. The value-based investment in value-based businesses, again, it's one of these things that makes abundant sense, but it almost hits you over the head through the pandemic. So through the pandemic, Medicare managed care businesses, big groups that were big into Medicare managed care businesses, groups that are just Medicare managed groups, that's, that's their sole purpose did extremely well. Peers did extremely well. It's not because they managed care so well. It's because they were still getting their premiums every month, and sometimes care wasn't being delivered, so they really cleaned up. Their medical coverage ratios went down through this horrible pandemic because some of the things that drive cost didn't get done. And so the value-based businesses of all sorts 
they fit into a couple core private equity theses. Aside from anything else, what I'll speak about this for one moment, then I'll talk about the core thesis is healthcare systems that are in value-based care found that their part of the portfolio that was value-based care last year through the pandemic did extremely well. Their part of the portfolio that did fee-for-service didn't do as well. And this makes sense because the fee-for-service stuff got shut down in certain places, slowed down. People were scared to come for the fee-for-service efforts. If they're getting a subscription payment, a value-based payment, then essentially they're getting paid regardless whether people did their procedures or not. And so health systems, one health system CEO described to me recently is there's a portfolio this balance between value-based and fee-based was terrific, and they did really well in value-based last year. Places like Kaiser, of course, are heavily value-based. Places like Intermountain now are 50% value-based and a lot more. It's a very similar concept that's driving private equity investing. If you look at you know, one of the gold standards in investing today is any business with sustainable revenue, repeatable revenue, recurring revenue, and in that regard, is anything that's subscription-based. And so you look at the Disney Plus, which grew to 100, billion subscri- 100 million subscribers, excuse me, Netflix, which is at 200 million subscribers, versus things that are transactionally used. And value-based fits into this theme of being, it's subscription, it's recurring revenue. So it fits into one of the core kinds of ways that people like to value businesses, because they know that revenues are coming. It doesn't go up or down based on whether a knee surgeon had a bad day or not, whether a knee surgeon's on vacation or not, Revenues come every single month. So what you've seen in the, in the healthcare sector, a convergence of things that have led a lot of investors to be wanting to move towards value-based businesses. And again, punctuated by the sale few years ago of healthcare partners for $5 billion or something crazy like that, there's just a lot of interest in value-based businesses of all sorts. And to private equity, from a private equity perspective, they very much fit a model that private equity is loves, which is predictable revenue. And so that's sort of my thoughts around value-based businesses, and there's so many of them, whether in behavioral health, whether in Medicare managed care, which has been one of the big, big growth engines, and so many things that support these businesses as well. So, Holly, those are some of my thoughts there. That's terrific. And with that, we'll move on to our third topic, which is investors moving sharply towards a world of loving asset light businesses versus asset heavy businesses. It would be helpful to maybe, within the healthcare context, hear a couple of, of examples of what this shift looks like and then some thoughts in terms of why you think this trend is emerging and why you think it's significant. Sure. I think what's happened is if you look at asset-like businesses, they're much more scalable around technology than asset-heavy businesses, and the margins on asset-like businesses can just be so overwhelming compared to asset-heavy businesses. So in healthcare, I think about this simplistically as follows. So I've got a technology that's going to be deployed by hundreds of hospitals or thousands of hospitals. I could build multi-billion dollar business without having to have a tremendous amount of bricks and mortar and not needing to have thousands of employees, thousands of providers and clinicians on my payroll every single month. So if I could scale it right, I mean, it's why when you see things like Google, it's astounding. I think Google this last quarter, I'll have the numbers a little bit off, I think maybe $54 billion in revenue and $18 billion, $17.9 billion in profits. I mean, the profit margins are astounding in businesses that aren't driven by, in that case, it's just a mega business. And I might have those numbers directionally, those numbers are directionally correct. I might have them not exactly right. But the point being, if you're in the technology business, once you get over a certain spot, the margins are fantastic. If you're in an asset-heavy business, lots of people or lots of facilities, the margins are just much less expansive. And it's not that there's not room for asset-heavy businesses. God knows we all want to be able to see a doctor when we can see one, and doctors are an expensive asset to have on your payroll, but we need them but these businesses that are really driven around connecting the assets, connecting the resources versus actually owning all the assets, it seems to be all the rage and it makes sense. The profit margins are magnificent. If you look at in the real estate business, it's very simplistically, it's the Airbnb, which is a connector of people in real estate, people in places to rent, versus owning all the real estate, which sounds like a big, big proposition and a much harder thing to scale. So that's sort of the concept of, and it really goes to the first theme of a huge movement towards 
digital investment, digital technology investment, and so forth. Got it. That's great. So that is the kind of first segment, first half of our topics, and we're going to move now more to the hospital and health system focus um, side. And obviously, hospitals and health systems have had a a year like no other last year in terms of a pandemic and elective procedures and just the crazy resource issues and PPE issues and other issues they've faced. And so this is certainly 2021 is another year like no other in terms of starting to come out of that and dealing with new challenges. So maybe, Scott, can you hit the first trend you want to cover with respect to hospitals and health systems in terms of what they're really focusing on now? Sure. So hospital and health systems find themselves in a place where obviously it almost goes without saying, but it's worth saying, where their people, their staff, their leaders, their physicians, their clinicians, their respiratory therapists, their janitors have been heroic this past year. They sort of lived every single day in the face of danger of COVID, not knowing whether they would get it or not. They showed up every day. Just a remarkable work by the health system, the entire healthcare system and workforce and everybody. The points on health systems are, last year, the core strategy systems obviously got rocked where they had to move in a completely different direction, which instead of pursuing their core days or core business, they were focused very much on the pandemic and treating COVID patients, moving from just treating COVID patients to treating COVID patients and everything else, but rocked by it. Many of them economically came out of it not that bad last year, partly because of government funding and help to sort of help them get through it. Now they take a breath this year, and some systems are still seeing surges. In Detroit, they're still seeing surges. In Oregon, they're still seeing surges. The pandemic's not going by any means. But you find health systems this year, again, returning to strategy plus. So the old strategies of a couple of years ago, but much with a great deal of acceleration around virtual care, customer experience, remote work environment, and we're all trying to deal with somewhat an exhausted workforce that they're trying to keep in place, recruit, retain, and so forth. But we see sort of hospitals, and looking again at, yes, we got a lot of government help last year economically, but that government help will largely be gone, so we got to get back to our core business. Plus, we got to be great at virtual, remote, and customer experience. And I talked to one hospital leader, CEO, the other day who said, look, this might be easier for a technology company with 100 employees. We're dealing with thousands of employees, and we know we have to move towards these things and take care of these things. But at the same time, we need to keep our workforce from a rail high. This is no easy challenge. So you've got this great challenge of health systems having to return to strategy after a very challenging year with enhancements to that strategy and trying to remain magnificent for the future. So that's sort of what we're seeing with hospitals and health systems in terms of strategy, returning to strategy, but it's strategy plus. So what has really changed for these hospitals and health systems? I mean, patients have obviously got much more used to a virtual experience and to a different way of life, but what else is going to be at its core different for these hospitals and health systems post-pandemic? I think there's big things and there's blocking and tackling things. Blocking and tackling things are we just have a huge shortage in an exhausted workforce in healthcare and trying to support the heck out of that workforce in every way imaginable and try to recruit and retain and encourage more people into the field, nurses, doctors, everything else. That's been accelerated in a significant way, those challenges. In terms of the business, I think there's two or three things. If you looked at a smaller health system not very long ago, it would have been heavily reliant on cardiology, orthopedics, spine surgery, neurosurgery, oncology, imaging, a handful of things that really drove a great deal of its revenues. Now hospitals are moving much more towards still having to retain those things as great things, but also a bigger portfolio of value-based business that maybe is not as reliant on those efforts, but also a huge acceleration in consumerization, what customers expect as customers, What's expected in terms of telehealth and virtual care recognizes there's going to be some sort of hybrid. Some of the workforce wanted to work remote. And then adding on to a lot of that, and very importantly, a hugely greater emphasis on health equity and taking care of the more vulnerable populations and serving a community mission to people of all economics, all races, all everything, and being much more focused on it from a workforce perspective through the community perspective. 
you've got the traditional strategy, trying to make sure margins work, plus a few big add-ons. And then we'll talk about some of the threats to all those things as well. No, that's great. So the next trend, I think, is really around competitive pressures for hospitals and health systems and figuring out how to really focus on patients in the face of, of competitive threats. Can you maybe talk to that trend a little? Certainly. So if you talk to large and important health systems, their game forever has been, and the ones that have been very successful have been situated so that ultimately payers and patients can't go around them. The core business model for health systems over the last decade to 20 to 30 years, and there are some differences in this, but the core, the core of it has been to be a great regional system or significant regional system where it's very hard in one's neighborhood for payers and patients to go around you. And that sort of would be like uh, the old business of taxi cabs where you couldn't go around taxi because there's no other option in town. And you wanted to be so strong and so dominant in the community that people couldn't go around you for care. It, as the world has changed, as Amazon gets more fully into this, as one of the biggest payers, United Optum, gets more fully into this and has its own workforce, its own physician force, this ability for a hospital to be indispensable, that you can't go around us, becomes harder and harder, particularly as more and more patients access their first contact with the health system somehow or another through the Internet. And if Amazon's hooking you up with a physician or Optum is versus your health system, now, the health system is behind the eight ball in terms of where the recurring and the longer-term revenues come from for the health system, because now it's so much easier for patients to and peers to go around the health system. So I'd say that sort of is the biggest threat out there to health systems is maintaining the spot where they're absolutely the number one and the first call for a patient. And, you know, you saw several years back, and I'm on a smaller scale, the opening of urgent care throughout the country. And we went from 3,000 to 12 to 13,000 urgent care locations, or a lot more than that at this point. And that led primary care physicians, hospitals, clinics owned by hospitals, to be much more responsive to their patients because they had to make sure that all of a sudden the hospital wasn't made irrelevant when somebody was sick, that you called the hospital, didn't just go to your urgent care, and you saw an improvement in customer experience because of that. Well, also, when your primary care doctor's office said, no, we can get you in today. We'll have sick hours. We'll do a number of things to make it easier to access us. Now, that trend, that concern is on steroids, the ultimate amount where people could start to do their first visit through telehealth with somebody else. And one of the fast things that you're seeing here is that the National Association for Telehealth, or one of the national associations, is trying to push very much the concept that telehealth should be reimbursed forever, that it's a positive, and so forth. And I think a huge percentage of Americans would agree with that. So nobody wants to be forced to go to the doctor anymore if you could actually do it by telephone, if you could do it virtually, you know, just, just for a million reasons, convenience, access, and so forth, for a lot of things you can't do it for, we strongly prefer it. And there is pushback, not just from Congress, who says this could add on more cost, but there's also pushback in some places from different health systems with concerns that this will make it easier for the Amazons of the world, the Optimus of the world, and a hell of a lot of others to go around the hospital health system. So if the core business of hospital health systems is to be the first call, to be indispensable, this changing world is changing that quickly in terms of the hospital's ability to put themselves in that position, hospital health systems. Got it. Great. So our final trend of the day is on the race of vaccines versus variants and issues of supply. Where are we and what can we expect? What are your predictions? Sure. So the U.S., obviously, to its credit, has gotten significantly ahead of a lot of the rest of the world in getting people vaccinated. And when I talk to health systems today, they're dealing with really three issues, the supply of vaccines, people to get people vaccinated, and then vaccine hesitancy. And you're seeing vaccine hesitancy still in inner city communities, in very rural communities, in very different places, but the same issue of vaccine hesitancy. And I think at one point, we may have been naive enough to think, well, it doesn't really matter if somebody else gets vaccinated as long as our own family gets vaccinated. As long as, you know, everybody gets vaccinated around me, what's the difference? It's their choice. They want to get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. But what we're finding very quickly is that we are very much one world, one population. We're all very, very connected. 
And so if one cluster rule gets vaccinated and another cluster doesn't, it just means that it's more likely that the virus will mutate and we're all going to be subject to different variants that keep on coming around. So you look at the situation where currently in other parts of the world, India is only vaccinating 2% of the people. They're having a horrible COVID outbreak. When this first happened and China was hit by the coronavirus or COVID-19, many of us felt, well, this is interesting. It doesn't really affect us, other than it messes up supply chains, but it doesn't really affect us. If we've learned nothing else over the last year, is that every community in the United States and every community internationally is connected. Even though it might affect us differently, I know the economics are different for different people, we are all very, very connected. So very laudable. We get as many people vaccinated here as possible, but then we have to turn to boosters and so forth, but also getting the rest of the world vaccinated because if we're not a heavily vaccinated world, new variants will keep on propping up and keep on uh, being of concern. One of the things I found fascinating, and you know, we're recording in late April of 2021, and the J&J vaccine was paused and then unpaused. So they're back to using the J&J vaccine. And one of the things I found fascinating was how thrilled about that health and hospital system executives are, because it's a one-shot dose, and many times when they're going out to the communities, many different communities for mass vaccinations or with mobile vaccination programs, there is no assurances that someone will ever get a second shot. Even in the best of circumstances, 10% of people aren't getting a second shot. So the beauty of a one-shot vaccine that will help reduce consequences and, and help people is lauded by hospital and health system executives. So I think, you know, even though it causes more concern with vaccine hesitancy because they had, they had some blood clot issues, which is a big deal, because nobody gets a vaccine because they get sick from the vaccine. Overall, I think the healthcare community is thrilled that that's a workable vaccine. So this race of vaccines versus variants and this concept that we are completely connected as a world, and we better not forget it, because if we forget it, we're going to have COVID keep on coming back at different forms and mutations that are going to be possibly more and more dangerous. So that's our thoughts on vaccines versus variants and what we're hearing from leadership in the field. That's fantastic. And it's kind of like that whole song about the knee bone connected to the uh, ankle bone. It's all, all very connected. And it's uh, both scary and exciting, and, and hopefully the, the vaccines win out here and we'll be in a much better spot in a few months. Scott, I'm going to finish with asking you for a book recommendation. If you could maybe tell our listeners a, a book that you've either recently read or would like to recommend as something that you got something from recently. Sure, and, it, and it's an unfair question because so much of my reading is completely fiction, ridiculous reading. I'm currently reading a John Sanford book, who I generally love, Ocean Prey. And I could say I got nothing out of it that I learned from. I mean, I always <laughs> learned something from it. I'm learning some other book, How to Be a Capital Study. The Capital is just trying to kind to spark ideas and thoughts. I just finished another Weak Child novel, none of which are earth-shattering or show great education or depth as a human being. But I enjoyed them. One of the sad things is how I is as one gets older, the sad thing is more and more of these books are of the audio tape variety audiobooks versus audio tape. There was actually audio <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. But you could assure you could be assured that you're not getting me to sing that knee bone knee bone song today. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you, Scott. It is absolute pleasure to get to have this dialogue with you. Thanks for joining the Across the Table podcast. Other episodes can be reached from the McGuire Woods Private Equity landing page. There is currently 13 episodes live there, all of which have very interesting guests, maybe worth a visit. So um, please reach out if you would like to suggest a topic or a guest for the podcast. We're all happy to connect with you at any point over pretty much anything. So thanks again to Scott, and uh, we wish you all the best. We appreciate you joining us on this episode of Across the Table. To learn more about today's discussion or to contact us, please visit our website at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. 
This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.